let's begin with the first panel. Um, as I said earlier, um, this is I conceive uh, this um, this seminar as the the sow uh, the sowing uh, of the seeds or the the implanting of this um, uh, of the foresight um, or the 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 anticipatory uh, um, way of looking into politics in, in uh, Catalonia. Um, and we do this, um, I don't know if this is the first of uh, a series of seminars, we will have to talk about that. Um, but if it was, um, this first seminar was, um, was uh, in need to, respond, um, to, to answer to some questions. Uh, for example, uh, the why and what for, which we address in the first panel. Uh, and the how in the second panel. Uh, these were fundamental questions that um, had to be addressed in this, in, in, in a supposedly uh, first seminar on this uh, on this matter. Um, so uh, let's begin with uh, uh, with this first panel uh, on the why and what for uh, of the uh, strategic foresight. Um, why should governments conduct uh, strategic foresight for, and um, what are the ultimate reasons for for doing so? Um, and, um, and the purpose behind um, the, the government's um, efforts to, uh, to, to do foresight. These are the, the fundamental questions uh, behind this, um, this first panel. And um, uh, in order to, uh, to talk about this, uh, to address these questions, we have uh, four participants. You all have the, the, the CVs in, the, in, your, in your maps. Uh, but nonetheless, I read some uh, or highlight some, some 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 things from from the CVs. Um, on my uh, right hand, um, there is uh, Frederick Matis, who is head of policies and networks in the Development Cooperation Directorate of the OE, uh, OECD. Um, before that, he was at uh, the United Nations uh, Development Coordination Office. Uh, prior to this, he was advisor to the United Nations. Um, he, always, uh, he also was advisor to the UN resident coordinators and UN country teams in Rwanda and Egypt, where he spent four years, I heard yesterday. And um, before his work in the UN, he worked five years in the government of uh, Belgium in the foreign affairs uh, department, in the Flemish uh, foreign affairs department. And um, he is uh, a political scientist, um, has a degree in political science and international studies from the University of Ghent, and an additional degree in European politics from uh, Louvain la Neuve. So um, I will present the other, um, the other uh, members of this uh, first panel afterwards. And uh, now we begin with, an, with a keynote from, from uh, Frederick. Please. Thank, thank you very much, Pao. Um, first of all, thank you to the, to the Barcelona Center for International Affairs for organizing this really interesting program and for inviting me today to give a, a keynote speech. I've, took, I've taken this quite literally, so I don't have a PowerPoint, I have a speech, um, and I was told that I was um, going to speak for 30 minutes. I probably will not speak for 30 minutes. I don't think I've ever spoken for 30 minutes in my life in one row, so <laughs> I'll try to keep it a bit shorter. Um, I also want to, to tell you I am not an expert um, in, in foresight um, at all. I'm working at the OECD, as, as Paul was mentioning, at the Development Cooperation um, Directorate. But it's exactly because I'm working on policies that I'm very passionate about um, foresight. And the European Commission was um, telling earlier that there's all sometimes a disconnect between foresight and, and the policy level or the political level. And that's exactly, um, you stole a little bit my thunder, uh, because I, that's what I wanted to talk about. I've seen the potential in, in large governments and international organizations how foresight can help bureaucrats as myself to think a little bit more freely and, and outside of their comfort zone and there to think boldly on how the future might look like and, and therefore also potentially be more creative in coming up with, with more innovative um, actions, not just doing what we keep doing because that's what we, we have been doing, yet it, it's very often what, what happens. So involving policy um, experts and political actors is, is really key, and, and that's why I'm really happy that I'm here seated in front of you um, as a policy expert and, and other foresight um, experts. My understanding is that a lot of you are actually um, foresight um, experts, so I'll probably say a lot what might be obvious for, um, for you, but just bear with me. Um, and I think it's good that you have a non-expert in front of you because I, I do think that foresight exercises, at least in my experience, have been concluded um, qu 
quite a lot without sufficient um, involvement of, of policy experts. I think we have to really remember that foresight is a process that needs to get the best out of the experts to shape and design our future. Without them, foresight is just going to be an interesting exercise, but doesn't necessarily lead um, to change. So now that I got this first frustration early in my speech out of the way, uh, let me add one more um, frustration before I'll go a little bit more um, substantive. So in the OECD, foresight has been taken quite seriously, and I'll explain um, how the OECD is showing uh, how important they think this is. And I'll highlight several initiatives of the OECD um, throughout my speech. But foresight and development cooperation, the field that I've been working in now for close to two decades, it, it remains quite um, obscure. Um, and when it's done, it's been seen as a goal in itself rather than as a process um, that helps us to define better policies. So it's not yet sufficiently integrated in our day-to-day -day thinking, and, and um, that, that's really a challenge. Actually, earlier this year, our directorate went to a little um, reorganization where all the policy areas like gender, governance, crisis and fragility, climate change, biodiversity, oceans, poverty and inequalities were all going to be housed in, in one division, the division that, that I'm leading. And I also pushed hard to have um, foresight of part of my portfolio to ensure that we could have better policies and that would be informed by using um, foresight. Um, now, the good news was that I actually won that fight, um, so I got foresight now in my portfolio. The bad news is that I did not have any budget for that, and I also don't have any staff for that. So it <laughs> looks beautiful in the organogram, but um, still a bit of work um, to do. So I hope that today's, today's conference will help me to find some arguments to convince my colleagues to have more foresight in, in our work. Um, so I'm also speaking with a lot of humility um, today in front of you um, because I'm here more in the learning um, phase, so I look forward to hear from you. But I also hope that my remarks will help to set the stage for today's um, discussion on governmental strategic um, foresight. So why foresight? Um, I think we all know that the world today um, is continuously transforming. We have a lot of geopolitical shifts um, creating unpredictability. The economy is in flux. There's an increased number of countries that are classified as autocratic, actually the large majority. We're facing public um, health challenges, rapid technological advancements that have both good and bad consequences. So all of this demands an innovative approach to governance and policy makings. This evolving landscape also underscores the benefit of applying strategic foresight in shaping policies as well as building capacity within our governmental um, frameworks. I don't think I need to convince anybody here of the imperative of, of strategic foresight, but I think it's good to keep reminding um, us, and, and I've already alluded to this with the example in development cooperation, why we are engaging in foresight. So it does not become an objective in its own right, it's a tool with a broader objective. Um, and indeed, recent years we've witnessed global events that have reshaped economies, disrupted healthcare systems, altered societal norms in profound ways. And these occurrences highlight the inherent risks of relying exclusively on historical data and present trends to anticipate the future. The need to embed strategic foresight into the core of our governance and policy making process is not just beneficial, it's really essential. Um, it was already alluded before, it's not about predicting the future, but looking at what are potential futures um, so that we can be well, um, well prepared. It's a structured approach to explore a range of scenarios, enabling governments to equip themselves with tools to deal with emerging trends and changes, challenges and opportunities they may bring about. The method is challenging existing assumptions and biases and widens our understanding of global dynamics and complex interactions moving beyond more uh, mere speculation to become a critical tool for modern evidence-based and anticipatory policy action and, and governance. By identifying potential opportunities and risks, strategic foresight enables policymakers to develop strategies that are proactive rather than merely reactive, ensuring that today's policies are resilient and adaptable to tomorrow's uncertainties. So given the complexities outlined, um, governance cannot afford to remain passive. They must actively shape as well as prepare for what lies ahead. This involves continuously identifying, testing and implementing innovative solutions to capitalize on our future opportunities and manage risks through enhanced resilience of public policies and systems. This approach, often referred to as anticipatory and innovation, should become an integral part of our organization's DNA, not just a periodic 
exercise. So what has the OECD done um, in, in the past years? We are helping our members in building, exploring, and better preparing for a range of alternative future scenarios, highlighting challenges and opportunities that each of these might um, bring. It points policymakers to signals and megatrends that they need to look out, as well as their potential implications, societies, economies, processes, and institutions. By doing so, the OECD helps its members in navigating uncertainties and rapid unforeseen changes, providing the tools to be better prepared to act and respond to such uh, changes. So the OECD is very committed um, to make this happen. Um, that's why we have the Strategic Foresight Unit, which is embedded into the Office of the Secretary General, to ensure that foresight indeed becomes part of our organizational um, culture. We collaborate globally to identify evidence and megatrends that could bring transformative impacts, thereby preparing our member countries and partners to navigate, adapt to, and shape the futures effectively. In fact, it's already since the 1970s that the OECD has been a champion of strategic foresight and long-term thinking as a core concept of modern, effective and anticipatory policy making and, and governance. So I'll highlight a couple of examples, and, and some of you actually um, might have contributed to this. Um, first is a Global Scenarios 2035 um, report, um, where we outline three potential futures, a multi-track world, <coughs> virtual worlds, and a vulnerable world. world each offering unique strategic challenges and opportunities. They were developed to identify their possible implications for the future of global collaboration and for organizations like the OECD. We had concrete scenarios like the ones provided here were very useful. They provide a foundation for countries to start a strategic discussion on how do we prepare for the unpredictable um, future. They have helped countries to explore what kinds of governance might be needed to address emerging policy issues in case the scenario on the virtual worlds, for example, is to come about. The vulnerable world scenario allowed countries to think about the most essential global collaboration if the time comes that humanity faces existential threats. Um, second example is the strategic foresight toolkit for resilient um, public policy. Um, this toolkit that's forthcoming is designed to assist governments in testing, refining their long-term strategies against a backdrop of diverse um, future disruptions. We have um, worked, for example, with the Lithuanian government under the European Commission's DG reform, and we, we um, looked at that toolkit and we designed, and it was used in, in Lithuania to support civil service um, in identifying the skills that might be needed for future civil servants in the country. To do this, the foresight <coughs> process was designed to provide direction how future disruption might influence all elements of the nation, including government, society, and the business community, and how these changes might alter the expectations of citizens around government service um, delivery. A third example is the OECD Horizontal Initiative on Anticipating and Managing Emerging Global um, Transformations. That is looking at um, areas such as artificial intelligence and synthetic um, biology. It, it helped us not only to understand these technologies, their risks and opportunities, but it also helps to prepare our societies and economies to anticipate and adapt uh, to them responsibly. For example, our artificial intelligence scenarios, um, which were developed by the OECD um, AI Futures Expert Group, are developed to enrich the discussions on AI futures. While a forthcoming crowd forecasting exercise will develop probability estimates related to key uncertainties in the field of um, artificial intelligence. It's one of, of great examples of leveraging multiple key analytical works from across the organization to streamline our thinking on possible implications of various emerging technologies on our economy and society. So these are three examples. <coughs> Sorry. These are three examples that the OECD has done um, within the OECD helping um, countries. We also engage directly um, with countries. Um, and I thought it would be useful to actually look at, at one um, analysis that we did where we did an assessment focused on enhancing anticipatory innovation. Um, and while this is, was for one country, I think those lessons are quite um, useful also for other lessons, and hopefully this will help stimulate um, the discussion. And there's about um, six um, recommendations. The first one is about futures um, literacy. Um, very often we still see in governments that um, foresight is suffering from a set of individual, collective, and institutional limitations that prevent the use of high-quality futures, knowledge, and policy-making. 
So we really need to build the government's future literacy and setting up also um, structures to integrate the strategic um, foresight within core strategic um, processes. Second is um, we need to better consider policy alternatives and also involve citizens in, in these processes. And that's why public servants, servants need to be um, acquired, need, need to acquire facilitation skills to work with citizen inputs and design open and inclusive policy processes to counter experts' <coughs> bias and, and group thinking. Third one is realigning strategic, budgetary, and legal steering systems to allow for the exploration of policy alternative and complex um, problems, as we see that this um, remains um, a big challenge. Fourth, um, counter silos and, and governments. Um, our research shows that organizational barriers are still a major obstacle for anticipatory innovation. Tackling this will require increasing mobility across silos and, and new collaborative um, architectures. Fifth, adopt new anticipatory innovation approaches and tools. For example, stress testing existing policies. This requires going beyond the reliance on individuals for experimentation and innovation efforts in government and expanding the toolbox connected to anticipatory innovation. It needs to be coupled with developing leadership skills and capacities that create demand for anticipation and setting up additional support structures and practices and organizations to develop signal reading and anticipatory policy making skills. And then the last one is about allowing for cross-government exploration of issues to preserve continuity of reforms while creating space for iterative and experimental um, approaches. Most complex policy, policy issues will not be solved in a four-year government term, so like climate change, natural resource uh, management, <coughs> socioeconomic um, reforms. So we need to look at um, a chronological distance between developing visions for alternative futures and their impl implementation, which often spans across several policy cycles. Anticipatory mechanisms could help bridge this gap by reducing time to, time to implementation of policies to ensure the continuity of and development mechanisms are needed to allow the, to continue policy exploration and development across policy cycles supported by new evaluation and measurement and procedures. We've done other examples. Um, and there are some of the opportunities we identified was that training programs for strategic foresight with the policy experts are required, creating safe space for experimentation, um, embedding foresight into decision-making processes to enhance civil preparedness systems, response to emerging um, challenges. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's progress, but challenges um, remain. I've already mentioned to you how important I think foresight is in my field of development, um, cooperation, international um, aid. Given all those crises that I spoke about, um, I think it's even more needed um, than, than ever um, before. Because the events of, of the recent years show us that we should never um, take for granted the progress that we have achieved in building sustainable societies, because such progress could be undone in, in a minute. Um, and we see it very clearly in the data today. Progress on the SDGs, for example, has stalled and in some cases even, even reversed. If we think about the future of development, therefore, we should consider how different issues and different policy areas will be dealt with, ranging from the economy, demography, environment, technology, governance, um, security, conflict, fragility, poverty and inequalities, etc. But it also requires that we re-perceive our fundamental assumptions about development and what it is what we're trying um, to develop. And just to give you one example that my own development cooperation directorate um, did, we did some science fiction um, and, and story writing. And in all the different scenarios, which would take me a little bit too far to elaborate in detail, one common assumption came out was that the state of the world in 2050 will reflect our collective failure to act at the level required by environmental crises. Goals of Paris have not been reached, the world is suffering the consequences. On finance, <clears throat> it's been a failure to create the incentives for it to behave constructively and consistently, despite the best intentions of some of its players. Civil society is more negative towards finance as it often is today. Um, so the participants stressed that the response to these factors of change and possible events would, would likely di diverge across the world. So those power balance or power imbalance will be key in shaping the dynamics in each area. I think we know um, this, and maybe you're a bit more optimistic than I am in life, but 
um, but having gone through this kind of methodology, it also helps us to think further on what is required um, not to come to those very pessimistic um, scenarios. And that's exactly why foresight is important, uh, but still under underutilized. Our tendency remains to move from crisis to crisis and continue doing what we've been doing in the past instead of taking a bit of a distance and investigate which actions are needed now to anticipate different um, futures. So I'm about to conclude. Um, so the Strategic Foresight Unit um, in the OECD convenes the government um, foresight community that offers a vibrant platform for exchange and collaboration to make better um, policies. We have virtual mar masterclasses, workshops, annual in-person and virtual meetings. It's a, it's a learning environment where foresight practitioners can exchange insights and best practices. Um, and we very welcome all of your participation in, in all of our OECD future government um, foresight community events and to exchange with, with our network. We'll have a new website which will be appearing in, in July. And in the meanwhile, if you would like to be engaged, you can also um, send an email to foresight at oecd.org. Um, in conclusion, the path to resilient and adaptive governance is paved with our ability to anticipate, adapt, and act. Strategic foresight is not merely a tool, but a foundational element in crafting policies that addresses today's challenges and ensures readiness for future uncertainties. I encourage each of you to engage deeply <coughs> with this field, participate in our discussions, and join our events. Um, let's shape a future that's not only possible, but also one that is preferable. I very much look forward to today's um, discussion and to your, to your insights, and, and I hope that you'll be back in a couple of years uh, where I can say, like, remember when I was a bit skeptical back in 2024? Um, we've changed that around, and foresight is now part of the DNA of development cooperation experts. So big expectations from you today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, before giving the word to the other um, members of this uh, panel, um, let me introduce you, uh, them to you. And, um, and before um, uh, the, the individual presentations, um, I will give them the opportunity to react to this first um, keynote speech um, by Frederick. So on my left um, is uh, anne katrin Bock. Uh, she's the head of the Competence Center of, on Foresight at the European Commission um, at the Joint Research Center. Um, she, she used to work in, in Seville, uh, um, but now works in, in, in Brussels. And um, she is, uh, she's German and she has a PhD. She holds a PhD in microbiology uh, from the Freie Universität Berlin. Um, on my far left, uh, there is uh, Francesc Claret. Uh, he's the head of the delegation of the Generalitat de Catalunya in the UK and I uh, Ireland. And um, before joining the Catalan government, he worked at the United Nations for over 20, 20 years. Um, he served, among other positions, at the, as the team leader of the policy planning unit in the UN Department of Political Affairs. Um, and his last assignment was uh, that of head of the office of the special uh, representative of the UN Secretary General for Colombia. He has a recent uh, PhD in legal theory from Leiden University, a legum magisto master in international criminal law, a master of arts in international relations, a BA in... <laughs> so um, <laughs> I wonder when you are going to stop. <laughs> um, and then on my far right, uh, Susanne Giesecke. Uh, she's a senior scientist and project specialist for Foresight at the Austrian Institute of Technology Center for Innovation Systems and Policy. Uh, she's a political scientist by training and presently works on qualitative innovation research. She has been engaged in several research projects uh, and Foresight, um, as well as Foresight networks. Um, and she's currently a member of the Foresight on Demand International Consortium, uh, led by the AIT, where she's conducting several rapid foresight projects. Um, well, what to highlight? Um, what else to highlight? Uh, um, and yeah, and she's a certified expert on sociocracy. Is it? Okay. Uh, have to tell, tell us about that. 
Um, Coffee break. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, before um, entering in your uh, individual presentations, um, would you like to uh, stress something from, from uh, Frederick's uh, um, presentation or to make any comment or to uh, disagree on some, on some parts or to, uh, to complement something? No? Yeah? Well, well, I couldn't agree more, on, of course, on the importance of foresight on policy making. But I was wondering, with all the foresight competence and maybe policy competence here in the room, how can we help you to overcome your frustration? Anything else? <coughs> Thanks a lot for this um, inspiring uh, talk and I think many of the points you raised indeed and this reflects our experience as well. Um, I think in the Commission as already Manuel uh, alluded to, so we've gone already a long way I think to starting to deal with these issues that you raised and we hope um, we will continue in that direction in the future as well. So. One point I would like to come back to is this involvement of policymakers in the processes. So this is something um, we try to do every time, so working together with the policymakers. Um, but of course there is a tension in that as well, because policymakers don't have a lot of time. So, and they are of course in the day-to-day -day business um, very much engaged, and adding to that, or or making the space for these long-term considerations is, is quite a challenge. And this tension, I think, is really, is not easy to, to solve and it's probably not going away. So this also requires from us a certain adaptation in how we do foresight, how we engage with them. But uh, I think that's one of the elements that still, I think, um, impede a bit the uptake of foresight, the active uptake of foresight, because people are very much engaged in the day-to-day -day business, going from crisis to crisis, yes, but it's really hard to, and it's a cultural change, it's a mindset change that needs to happen, and that is, takes its time as well. Thank you very much. I think a lot of the issues will most appear of in your side, exactly. All right, okay. I would like to add, to add uh, one um, further question. Um, is um, what are um, what are the origins of? Uh, I mean, OECD is the forerunner of foresight in in Europe. So, um, what triggered the initial interest in in foresight? If you can elaborate on this. Okay. Thank you. I, I think on your last question, I would not have an answer. I'm not long enough at, at the OECD yet, um, and I actually was going to use your kind of question to answer um, Susanna's um, question. How can we help you to overcome the frustration? It's, um, I very much look forward to today to, to get some good examples and um, also how you have changed that culture. Um, I started my career as a, as a change management consultant um, and one of the big elements that we were, that I was working on was, it was not necessarily about um, a new methodology or um, putting in a new tool in place, it was about changing the culture, about explaining to colleagues that they could do things differently and if they would look at um, a certain aspect a little bit differently they would be more effective, they would be more efficient, um, there would be less damage um, in, in the case of the project that, that I was working on. So I, I fully agree, it is really about that um, about that, that cultural um, change and it's the same with the involvement of the policy makers. Every time I have brought it up with my colleagues as well, they're like, oh, there he is again, he's going to add another layer. Um, and coordination takes time and, and it's, it's a lot of um, extra work. So as a side, I'm, I'm also teaching at the, at the, um, at the university in, in Paris at um, Sciences Po and there I actually did a four hour workshop on, on foresight. Um, with a, with a colleague of, of the OECD Governance um, Directorate to kind of test how it would be um, possible. Students are a little bit more um, 
I have less, I have more control over the students than I have over my own colleagues. So let's let's keep it at that. Um, and it was actually really interesting. And and what they came up with um, was was quite different than what we would have, what I would have been able to to teach with a PowerPoint presentation or send them um, some articles. So I do think it, it's really about that um, culture change. Um, and it's, it's a really good question on, on where, where the origins of foresight and, and the OECD. I'll go home and I'll do my homework to actually really understand it because it might actually help me also then to not only see it um, in, in some of the directorates where it's working very well and, and where a lot is being done and why maybe it isn't necessarily done in my own directorate. So that's a very good suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we'll begin with the individual uh, presentations. Um, Francesc, it's your turn. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. Um, as, I'm very happy to be here for two reasons. First, because um, we've been talking with, with Pao about this uh, foresight need for the Catalan government. Very glad to, to see that you know, there's, there's some track movement on this. Um, obviously, in the uh, delegation, we do not do per se foresight, um, although as a government, we also always look at what's coming. But I do ask for your indulgence in here for a few minutes, because um, this is the first time I can speak about it from the other side. So for 20 odd years, I was in the UN. My last assignment was as team leader of the policy planning unit in the Department of Political Affairs. Um, so what I'm going to do is some hindsight, not some foresight. Um, just trying to highlight some of the issues that when I was involved in there, perhaps I didn't see clearly. They are not lessons learned. Um, these are some of the remarks uh, with a pinch of salt, of course, and you know, some of the criticisms that come when, when you've done something and, and then you're not working in there um, and you don't get the, the paycheck from them anymore. Um, so it's, it's just five points that I want to make, perhaps a bit, a bit uh, on the philosophical side. When I was the uh, team leader of the policy planning unit, we were engaged in what we call the year of reviews. Everything was reviewed. We had the um, uh, high-level panel on peace operations. We, had, we came up with the concept of sustaining peace. The Women, Peace, and Security Agenda was, was being reviewed. The Human Rights Upfront Initiative was being put on the table. So there were a lot of things happening. And all of this happened because we were looking as an organization and how could we remain fit for purpose in a changing world while being truth to our mission and our vision while taking advantages of new opportunities and, 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 and new challenges that were all around now. And just bear in mind, my words are very, very much centered on the business security pillar of the UN and the one mission that the UN had, which is the prevention of violent conflict. So while I understand, you know, foresight in the economic world, as a business, there, there are many different ways of doing it. I am focusing on the core of the UN business, which was, which was prevent, prevention of, uh, of, of violent conflict. And that pretty much centers the five points. So the first point that I want to make is foresight is intrinsically a political exercise. Um, it is a political exercise because foresight means bringing sight to the fore, meaning bringing the vision that you have for whatever it is, a better world, a more unified Europe, a business that grows in sales, whatever it is, bringing your vision, bringing your sight to the fore. So bringing that foresight, uh, bringing that sight to the fore means making political choices and imagining what is your role and your place within that future or those scenarios that you are trying to find out. I mean, it is hard, of course, to imagine, to build a scenario, to build a future without knowing what's your role or what, what's your vision or what, 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 what you want to play in that, in that scenario. And that's a difference that the UN could do that some of the governments cannot because we were a organization that had, of course, a long-standing history, and we were not bound by, you know, electoral terms. So we could have that luxury, if you want, of building longer-term scenarios and thinking ahead um, with that vision in mind. 
who are we and what, what's the world that we want to, that we want to ima imagine. But of course, foresight is a strategic and it's a political exercise, but it's also an exercise that is constrained by who you are, but what your mandate is, but what your resources are, but what uh, you know, your, your UN charter says, but international treaties say. So it is not that when you imagine, when you imagine scenarios, you just go absolutely wild, you're always constrained within a certain narrative of, of uh, so to overcome that um, short-sightedness is when imagination has to come to, to play. And you know, people being able to imagine new plays and bring it all together. But again, my experience was there's always this framework of who you are, what's your mandate, and what's the political space that um, is given to you. So, as I said, the foresight is a political exercise because it has two main components. One, it obliges those that make the exercise to make political choices. But two, and even more important, it allocates responsibilities uh, for those that need to make those choices or engage in those actions and for those that do not engage in those actions or do, or do not make those choices. And let me put uh, a quick example. So from 2010 to 2012, the Department of Political Affairs at that time engaged in an exercise which was the DPA horizon scanning with the UN Security Council. The idea was that DPA, the department, which is now, by the way, DPPA, Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, at my time was just DPA, um, we would go to the Security Council and put on the table issues of concern, raise alarms and early warning um, on issues that could explode. And we thought that was uh, you know, a foresight and exercise and that, that could bring to the table some interesting elements from member states to, to react. But of course, when we did that, first off, member states did not control at that stage what we would say. Second off, member states did not have control about which responsibilities we were allocating, saying, if you do not do this, this is going to happen. If this country doesn't stop doing this, this is going to happen. Um, and then, of course, they were blamed for acting or not reacting. In shortness, um, two years, the exercise was killed. So we never again had a horizon scanning exercise at the Security Council because, of course, member states were not ready or able to assume those responsibilities of the forecasting or the foresighting exercise. I mean, we, we never really had a capacity, a true foresight capacity, because member states would see it as intelligence. So there's always a fine line between having intelligence capacity or having foresight capacity. And member states were always making sure that the UN did not have its own intelligence gathering capacities or resources, because again, that would put on the table some issues that they did not want to hear. I repeat, the exercise was skill. Of course, there are many other venues in which um, these issues are put on the table. We have you know, the monthly luncheons of member states with the Secretary General. We have informal briefs in the Security Council. We have uh, the country common assessments. We have the UNDAVs, or they have the UNDAVs. Um, so there is a lot of exercises to build scenarios about conflict and development, etc. But mind you, these exercises either remain internal UN exercises, or these are exercises that the nature, the nature of these exercises do not assign responsibilities, concrete responsibilities to anybody. Um, so, and, and it's only been very few occasions and recently in Gaza that the Secretary General has invoked Article 99 to bring to the Council an issue that threatens international peace and security uh, because, of course, that is telling member states you are to blame because this is a real threat. Um, but I guess that when that happens, when the Secretary General comes with that article, it's a bit too late already to, to be a scenario um, that has not already been, already been built. So that's the first kind of reflection kind of lesson. So my second uh, point is, so how do you do foresight um, in an uncertain world? So when the UN was created, what it meant to do with the UN Charter is to give some kind of guidance, some kind of moral political constraint to the civilized nations. Mind you that to be a member of the UN, the only thing that you need is to be a peace-loving country. That's what the Charter says. So it was meant to provide some sort of guidance, moral political guidance for behavior. Even though things happen, you could somehow expect what would happen because member states still felt bound by, by, by certain narratives 
whether human rights or you know, the MAD, the mutual, uh, mutual Assured Destruction Doctrine, saying if you use nuclear weapons, we will all disappear. That was enough to prevent member states from engaging, but also the rules of the game were clear. There were some people that had more power than others. If you engage in this behavior, this will happen. So that was enough for deterrence, so to speak, to happen. That's over. It is not that norms are openly defied, it's that norms really do not provide that moral compass, so to speak, to guide behavior from states. I was one of the naive people that thought that Russia would not invade Ukraine because Russia, being a member of the P5, would be very aware of the consequences that that would have for, international, for the international system, or that Israel would not engage in genocide in, in Gaza because they would be very much aware of what that would do for the concept of human rights, and yet it did happen. So how do we build scenarios in a time where these norms that we had and we hold dear in the international community do not exist anymore. Well, that's where a scenario planning actually is more um, necessary because that uncertainty, what provokes is the need to build scenarios based on assumptions that things that had happened so far are not anymore. Rules and behaviors and ways of doing are not anymore. It's not that you just defy the norms, it's that many countries now defy the very basic of what is the international order and how the world needs to look at. And as I said at the first, in the first point, being a vision of what you are and what you want to achieve, whether you're a country, a government, or, 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 a, com or a company, it's necessary to build those scenarios. So when we don't know what kind of world we want to build, it's very difficult to foresee what's, uh, what's going to happen. So my third point, um, rather than foresight, really what we did at the UN was policy planning. And what I mean by policy planning is just to make sure that we had policies in place to absorb, react to the shocks of a system that we could not very much control. So we analyze. Um, what are the resources that we have? What are the mandates that we have? What are the opportunities that we have? And plan accordingly, of course, to an uncertain uh, future where these norms, of course, do not exist anymore. So the, the, the foresighting exercise, what it did is try to bring some order within that uh, very uncertain scenarios that we had um, in, in front of us. And Again, a bit of a criticism and, um, and you know, in hindsight rather than foresight. While member states were engaged in the big game, in the big plans of the world, really what the UN did is kind of do collateral scenarios. Um, when we talk about human rights violations, when we talk about humanitarian assistance, when we talk about localized conflicts, um, the UN really was at the margins of the big game that member states were conducting. So we were never in, but never out. We were planning for the consequences of larger scenarios over which we had uh, very, little, uh, very little control, but yet we had to be um, very mindful of what the consequences of that would be. Third and almost last point is, so we did not do foresight, we actually did policy planning, planning which policies to put in place to absorb those shocks, but those policy planning are always on a crisis mood, and that has already been, been spoken. So it's always, DPA was, by definition, a crisis department, because we looked at conflict prevention, we looked at how you know, um, conflicts could be resolved through preventive diplomacy, through special political missions, through good offices, so always in crisis mode. And that crisis mode, embedded in the very DNA of the department, of course, prevents you from seeing other things and already marks what kind of, uh, of policy processes um, you want to, or you can put um, together. So basically, crisis management means prioritizing. We all know what was happening. We just needed to prioritize what was more important and what needed to, uh, to be made. So um, what we did before in terms of you know, the high-level panel on peace operations or the women's business security agenda is what's happening right now also. The new agenda for peace, the summit of the future, what need all these exercises, the COPs, all of these exercises, what these do is, okay, well, we have identified this big ticket 
issues. And these are the things that you need to prioritize. And we need to sit down with member states and with the large international community, and everybody has a responsibility on that. Member states, NGOs, civil society, think tanks, governments, whoever it is. So this prioritization is what the UN has in mind of the multiplicity of crises, which ones we need to prioritize, and those we're going to invest. And a lot of these exercises, like the future that we want, the common agenda, um, is nothing but trying to put on the fore, what are those uh, priorities um, that, that we need to focus otherwise? You know, UNDP had this, I don't know if you saw that ad in which you had a, um, a dino coming to the General Assembly saying there's no plan B, don't be like me, uh, don't go extinct. So this is basically the prioritization that, that we're doing now. Um, and my almost last point, um, so we know we're doing planning in crisis, but this is a bit of self-criticism, and you may throw things at me because I know that a lot of us do for, you know, for citing in here. Um, but sometimes, and if we are true to it, there are very little new things that are put on the table in these exercises. So we tend to have, or at least in the UN, we tend to refry a lot of the elements and a lot of the knowledge that we had. We bring some new data, we bring some new elements, we bring some new actors, we bring, oh, some new balls, uh, you know, all new elements in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different scenario. Uh, and that's when, when foresight needs to be disruptive. If we depart from the same premises, we're gonna have the same results. And many times in the UN, we knew perfectly what was the problem, and we knew perfectly where the solutions were. Um, but we refried it and, and kind of put few new elements on the table. And that is a problem because of two reasons. Because over an, uh, over an analysis of things, perpetuates the problem. The more you talk about it, the less you do about it, because the more you need to talk about it, because there are new elements that you need to talk. And it becomes part of the problem um, because at least in the international community, we embed ourselves in the short-term um, responses to this big forecasting that we're doing with humanitarian assistance or you know, uh, good offices in here. Or... So um, my, my um, final conclusion with this is if we want to do real foresight with impact, those that engage in it need to own it. And that's been the problem in many uh, of the UN attempts, which of course member states, I always you know, said that there are two UNs, the UN of member states and the UN of the secretariat and the agencies that do the work while these think about the big, uh, the big picture. But for any foresight to be effective, and that's the point of connecting the political with the reality, connecting the engagement, the real activity with the thinking, those that engage in foresight need to own it. Those that create the, uh, the uh, structures for foresight need to invest in them and accept the results and accept the responsibilities and the allocation of roles that will come out of these exercises. Otherwise, we are uh, just doing you know, an intellectual exercise for the sake of an intellectual exercise. And we need to commit to it, and it's not easy. For instance, the decolonization agenda has never really been part of the foresight of the policy planning processes. Because if you look at who's doing good and how is doing good and who decides still what's going to happen, it's pretty much uh, one side uh, of the world. The same with gender issues, the same with so many other agendas. So uh, my last point is own it, be inclusive, and be prepared to accept the responsibilities and the allocation of roles and actions that these exercises will come out with. Thank you, sorry for the, uh, you know, the philosophical kind of uh, nature of this, but uh, totally enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's quite shocking, uh, the vision of uh, UN, uh, United Nations being a, a collateral <laughs> scenario builder rather than the scenario builder in the, or the, 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 the most important one in the world. It's, it's shocking. We can talk about it um, uh, afterwards. Now, it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, um, Anne Katrin's uh, turn.
Let me move the slides, probably. <laughs> so I will use some slides um, and probably less philo philosophical about uh, foresight. Um, but I would like to start with uh, thanking the organizers for the invitation to this event and for uh, providing me with the opportunity to um, share some of the aspects of our work on foresight. So as already mentioned, I'm coming from the Joint Research Center and I need to do this. Yes. And uh, so which is the um, science service of the European Commission and more concretely I'm coming there from the EU Policy Lab. So the EU Policy Lab uh, has been created already some years ago to bring innovation into how policies are being developed. So we are providing there a space but also the tools to uh, explore policy issues in a collaborative way, to challenge assumptions, beliefs, and to look at policy aspects, um, bringing in different perspectives. So it's this context in which we um, apply the strategic foresight in the uh, European Commission at the JRC. So working closely together, in particular with our colleagues uh, coming from the design thinking field. And to work with policymakers on, uh, so across policy fields in a participatory way and with a long-term view. So the intention behind that is to um, help policymakers, support policymakers in, <coughs> in the challenges or with the challenges they face. So they are acting in a very dynamic, very fast changing environment. So we heard that already today. So they need to identify viable options and opportunities. They need to react and adapt to changes. But at the same time, they need to put forward robust and effective policies, so also to earn the trust of the citizens, but also to keep the trust of the citizens. So they need for that to be able to detect and also to anticipate change. They need to be able to understand change and to work across policy silos to engage with a broader range of stakeholders because the complex problems that we face today cannot be solved in isolation. And in all of that, foresight can be very helpful. And in the end, doing policies, policymaking is about shaping the future. And this, of course, should be done in uh, the best informed way possible and in a kind of future informed way. So how do we do this at the JRC? So we have, uh, would we'll like to focus on, on three, let's say, main pillars of our activities today. So what is important is to um, focus on the major policy needs. And we've identified three for our work. So this is sustainability transitions, technology foresight, and future risks. So also with the um, thought uh, behind so that, of course, also from our perspective, from doing foresight, so we need to also culture um, expertise in the different fields and also establish networks in these different fields to work with. So for sustainability transitions, I think it's clear that, so looking at um, the development outside, that transformational change is needed for the EU to reach the sustainability goals. So this is not happening by itself and needs fundamental change. But the question is how this change can be defined and can be implemented in a very volatile environment that is constantly changing, that is complex, and that poses challenges. So here, our main output so far have been the um, the Commission's annual strategic foresight reports, or so our support to these reports. So Manuel already mentioned those, um, so that we, um, that the Commission issued in the last uh, four years, looking at resilience, strategic autonomy, the green and digital transition, but also with the last one, looking at the social and the economic aspects of this sustainability um, transition. But we're also focusing on more uh, concrete policy fields, so 
not on this high level um, cover it all foresight um, work. So for example, working together with the Department on Agriculture on uh, digitalization in agriculture. So what does it mean? What purpose should it serve? And uh, so also given that this will be implemented in a rapidly changing world, what do farmers need? What are the values behind these? And also translate this into a toolkit that we then put forward so that policymakers can use it, and they're actually using it, to develop uh, digitalization strategies in that field. So the aim is here to, to um, yeah, create or generate tools that are useful, that can be further used to, um, with the results of these types of work but also to um, generate actionable knowledge that can be taken up by policymakers to, um, to inform the policy making. So technologies, as we all know, are very important and innovation is important for the EU for um, remaining competitive in the world, for keeping its global standing in the world but also for the uh, strategic autonomy in critical technological areas. So here we focus on the identification of emerging disruptive and or critical technologies. So looking at specific policy domains or policy challenges, and also looking at um, the enabling conditions for these technologies, the drivers for their development, so opportunities and challenges they might bring. So with the aim then to see, so what does it mean for policy? What are the issues that need to be dealt with? So we're here currently working very closely together with the European Innovation Council. So we are informing their funding programs, their portfolio um, setting for um, technological advances they, um, they look at. And we do this also in a way very closely together with them so that there is capacity building along the way so that it's not us providing that service forever, but that they can take over and integrate the way of, um, of doing that. And the last um, part is um, the future risks. I think that's probably an obvious need that we want to cater for. It's a very recent activity that we only started last week and we are currently, um, we are about to uh, or prepare the last bits for uh, the first report to come out on on risk clusters, so next month. Based on horizon scanning, we heard that already as, um, as an approach and weak signal analysis, so to, to see so what are possible risks that might emerge and what are actually the developments that could lead to those. And also here we aim then as a follow-up to develop a kind of toolkit, a kind of um, more practical way of um, using this approach and the results to inform policymakers and to foster discussions on these issues. The second um, pillar I would like to briefly talk about is the development and the provision to making available foresight tools for future-proof policies. So we um, we develop along the way, so doing foresight for the Commission, we develop certain approaches, we develop certain infrastructure of um, either outcomes um, or approaches that we make available and that can be used and taken up by other entities, so be it internal in the Commission, but also by externals. So we have a um, rolling process um, doing horizon scanning so we do this in the context of ESPAS that was already mentioned. So it's an inter-institutional um, network. And here we're working closely together with the European Parliament, for example. And we, so this is about a crowdsourcing the science of new and then having workshops or making sense of these and developing out of this um, the signals for change. And we put these forward in uh, three times per year in the horizon scanning bulletins. So distribute this also in the commission, but it's for everybody to have a look at, to use, and, um, and see if there is anything interesting um, to, um, to follow up on. 
We have um, one program that um, is about involving citizens. It's called Our Futures. So it's an invitation to citizens to share with us their ideas about the future, their hopes and fears for the future. And behind this is a sense-making tool that allows... Oh, there is now the second one coming. <laughs> that allows an analysis of um, these different ideas of citizens. So it's a way of getting in their views of, um, of knowing what, what ideas are, so what are the main topics they are interested in, what are the visions they have for the future, and, uh, but also so who should act on the future, should it be them, so how do they see this. So this can be done on an EU level, but there also can be national um, analysis. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity for you to invite uh, to participate, so share your ideas with us but also use this as a tool um, for your own purposes because it's publicly accessible and Peter is already yes. <laughs> doing this. Sorry to interrupt, just on our futures. Um, we will start to communicate that from June. Uh, but we work together with uh, with the GRC and with uh, all. So we have a, we have a, a regional uh, collectors based so I just wanted to add to Anne Catherine's that uh, we work together with the GRC and with Paul to create a regional art futures, um, including so citizens can select their region, and we have thanks to the collaboration we have a, a, a version in uh, in Catalan, um, so the citizens in Catalonia. They can go to the regional and they can submit how they see their future of Europe in Catalan. It will be announced and communicated uh, starting from June, but I thought it's good to mention it here. And I also would thank uh, both the collaboration with the GRC, but also with, with the Catalan government uh, to allow these things. Yeah, so the idea is indeed, and it is available, I think, in 24 languages. And the Catalan is the latest edition <laughs> to that, so it's a very accessible tool um, in that sense. So we have, um, furthermore, we have the Megatrends Hub. So it's um, based on a set of megatrends we developed some, some years ago. A set of 14 megatrends, so trends that we already see today, but that uh, we expect to continue in the future and that have a significant impact on the future. And taking them as a set, it allows a kind of 360 degree exploration of the topic of interest. So that information is available, um, also underpinning information and also instructions on how to use these megatrends. So in a, for example, a half day <coughs> workshop. And the last edition, to the toolbox, and there are some more, of course, as well, um, are the reference foresight scenarios. So we developed a set of four scenarios depicting the global standing of the EU in the world by 2040. And the idea behind that is to have already a starting point there from which to um, facilitate the exploration of the future using scenarios. So you don't have to start every time from scratch. You might need to add to these scenarios depending on the topic you would like to look at, but the basic work has already been done and it's also available. And these two tools, the megatrends and the uh, reference foresight scenarios, these are actually also the tools that are put forward in the better regulation toolbox that also was mentioned already by uh, Manuel. So since um, late 21, Foresight is included in the um, toolbox for the better regulation process for the impact assessment of new policy initiatives. And every policy initiative that the Commission puts forward needs to go through an impact assessment. And there are, of course, also more traditional tools in this uh, toolbox. It's pretty large, actually. And uh, now we have uh, managed to include foresight there, and we see um, increasing use of foresight in the impact assessment processes. So it's 
The idea behind is, of course, to um, foster the development of future-proof policies so that key uncertainties are integrated um, and that changes are anticipated. And more concretely, so we've uh, put forward, um, say, two major steps in this process where foresight could be useful. So all of these processes start with the policy problem definition. So you need to know what problem do you want to solve. And uh, you can use the megatrends tool or the foresight reference scenarios to see, so how could that problem actually develop in the future, in the next 10, 20 years? Does it change? Are there new aspects being added to that? And what does it mean then for the policy objectives I have and what I actually need to tackle? So that's uh, one thing. So in a later stage, when you have already your policy options, so be it that you go for a soft approach, guidance, or you do um, um, legal uh, requirements, so, we, um, so with the use of the reference foresight scenarios, you can do a stress testing of these policy options. So how would these policy options actually perform in the different changing future environments that could be there? Are they robust enough? So, and if they aren't robust enough, so how can we actually change them, adapt them so that they might be robust in different framework conditions from which we don't know which one will happen, of course. There's no prediction but making them as robust as possible um, for a future to be capable to work still under different future developments. So I would like to finish with the um, third main activity that we have. So it's about capacity building. So that was already mentioned today. Um, so of course the participation in foresight processes is the best training that you can get and the best um, understanding of how foresight is being done, but that reaches only a very limited number of people. So in terms of internal training, we have put forward um, a training package on foresight. So it's a general introduction, but also includes training on the different tools um, that we have. We also have um, training uh, offers for external use. So for, via the TED Education, there is an online training available. Uh, it's called Future Forward. It targets young people, but is a very good, um, easy entry into foresight. So looking at, so what are perceptions of time, for example, future mindsets, alternative futures. We're currently working on uh, developing an online training so geared um, towards member states. So providing information on how foresight is being done, but also information on how foresight is integrated into different public administrations. So to see what works, what doesn't work, and um, also for member states to see what would best fit their situation. Of course, there are already, um, meanwhile, several examples of member states doing foresight. I mean, Finland is of course always, or still the prime example with a long history of doing foresight. I think they do it now since 30 years. So this is something to learn from and we would like to put that forward and hope to have that in place um, beginning of 2025. And the last bit um, is our website, of course. So all our products, the tools, reports, everything is available on that one on that website and I would like to use this opportunity to invite to, you to have a look and um, use what you think is interesting for you and if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne-Kathrin. Um, now we turn to uh, Susanne Giesecke. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation and the introduction. 
Um, let me tell you that I'm very delighted to see so many young people in the audience. So I hope that you will all be inspired by our talk on foresight and bring this into policy making. And I want to bring um, a kind of example uh, for foresight and policy making in the domain of research and innovation policy. And what we did at the um, Austrian Institute of Technology is we, we did uh, quite a broad study um, for the European Commission, actually for DGRTD um, on how to set priorities for um, future spending on research and innovation activities. So this is part of Horizon Europe, but also goes beyond. And it's actually, it was part of um, a large project in a framework contract that was already mentioned in the introduction that we had uh, for the European Commission, the Foresight on Demand Consortium. And in this audience and also on the uh, panel later in the afternoon, there are a few colleagues of mine, Filine and Totti, for example, who are also part of this consortium. Uh, so so why, um, why do I refer to research and innovation policy? Um, first of all, it has always been tightly connected to foresight because it is important to kind of anticipate or to look at trends that are going on um, that should be continued or not. And also technology and technology policy and then later in history innovation policy are usually associated with solving a lot of problems uh, that we have in the future or being more competitive for a country. And so I'm not saying that this is true, but this was always the um, association with it. Um, so we, we tried to develop several visions for a future R&I policy. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about so much on foresight right now, I, I will de, um, look deeper a bit into R&I policy making and how it has been changing in the last years and what are the challenges we are facing now and how foresight can help tackle these uh, challenges. So what we are confronted with, and it was already said in the previous talks um, on a EU policy level, but also on a member state level, are things um, that are very volatile. Um, we, have, we are facing a lot of disruptions and we are expecting to face more. And there's always a question, how can we best be prepared to cope with those, um, to remain some stability also for our democratic constitutions? And also, how can we use technologies or emerging technologies to maintain a certain level of lifestyle? And how can we um, cons consolidate or, or adjust to disruptions or developments like climate change, for example? And then there are also, of course, certain values, uh, for example, those that are inscribed in the um, European contract, so you know, uh, striving for co coherence and prosperity and maintaining democratic values uh, in the EU and so on. And then of course there's always a question, um, how, what is Europe's future role in terms of global development? So, so how can Europe have a certain influence? And we hope, or we are convinced actually, that uh, foresight can help to explore both this uh, volatile context and the disruptive developments. So what was uh, the background of our study in order to um, perceive uh, future strategic options? So the scene was pretty much uh, looking into the year 2040. Um, now and then we will be confronted with a high level of uncertainty 
and, and the paper is supposed to give um, some guidance and outlays for Horizon Europe in, uh, until 27 uh, and beyond that. So it's also um, a guide for investment approaches. And the conclusions drawn from this study are said to be instrumental in the definition of a European approach to research and innovation in the coming years. And it was also designed to help the EU um, to engage in some out-of-the-box thinking to be better prepared for potential risks. Um, one conclusion is that more disruption and um, crises are expected. And I will highlight some of these disruptions um, in the next slides. And a recommendation for the EU, a very superficial one um, <clears throat> to summarize, is that it's important to maintain a range of technological, but not only technological, investments to prepare for whatever uh, future emerges. But the, the, um, the study is actually almost 400 pages long, so there's, of course, much more into that. And a cross-cutting message is that you know, policy making, but also society uh, need to be um, more flexible and adaptable. So we, we try to uh, cluster here the areas of disruptions, and these are also um, chapters in the report. The, the first, the red box on the top is uh, the global challenge. So these are things that the EU cannot do by itself but where really international cooperation is um, necessary. So one is the geopolitical reconfiguration, climate change, and global commons. Of course, there might be more, but these are the hot, um, hot topic in the, in the report. And then there are some other clusters that should really be of concern for the European Commission, but also for member states, and beyond that, I would say also for, for regions and cities and so on to work um, together on these issues. So there is a cluster on um, social and value changes. I will go into that. And on the other side, technology and society and the um, society and nature, which needs some kind of uh, redefinition in its um, relationship. And maybe some of these issues will be important for future um, framework programs and R&I to come. So I have highlighted a few issues here, but. Uh, for time reasons, I will not go into those, but of course you can always um, download the report from the internet. So the global landscape <coughs> entails um, disruptions that have a huge potential and may lead to tectonic shifts in the patterns of power and influence at the global level. And if novel ways of addressing the problem of climate change, for example, are pursued uh, from geoengineering to nature-based solutions, uh, we may see new lines of conflicts that uh, may emerge among countries and have thus far um, coexisted peacefully. So there is um, always you know, some remedy, but this may also cause new conflicts. Then the same holds uh, for the global com commons topic, because whatever or not, it will be possible to establish cooperative government arrangements for global commons, and climate depends on the emerging configuration of geopolitical relationships, which can be conducive or detrimental to collaborative government arrangements. And from a European perspective, um, the future relationship with the United States and the need to join forces will be decisive for Europe's ability to continue playing an influential role in these government arrangements. So this is uh, on the global landscape. 
And then more on, on the EU, um, European landscape um, when it comes to social and value changes. There were, for example, issues on the future of health and health systems, where, of course, a lot of potential li lies in innovation and research, and also a lot of expectations that current diseases and future diseases um, will, be, will find some remedy. But at the same time, of course, it's always a matter of access to health systems so who can really profit uh, from these advancements and will governments be able to um, also provide good health service for, um, for not so wealthy people. And this kind of relates already to a hot topic, I think, that is a social confrontations that will, we are seeing now play a really important role in social media and, and not only there and probably also will be um, important in our futures. So uh, this is rooting in some societal fragmentation that have not been tackled so much in the past but now come more to the fore and uh, there are certain societal groups that yeah, are being reinforced in their social media um, echo chambers and if there are, is no reconciliation we might really have um, severe um, confrontations in our society or, or even a, a break of civilization and maybe a, a turn to authoritarian challenges and there's connected to this maybe also the fear that there is more um, interpretation presentation of criminal and lawful economic activities because, um, for example, where some technologies are emerging, like cryptocurrency, it's not always clear where uh, the line is drawn between what's criminal and, and what's uh, lawful. Um, there are other issues um, in the relationship between technology and society, especially with artificial intelligence, where we see a race for global supremacy. So it can be a great opportunity for a lot of businesses and uh, personal development. But it, there's also, of course, the question, um, is this dominated by just a few companies and where are these companies located and also what European um, economy and policy um, can, um, ca can ha have to say to these issues or can influence uh, these developments or if Europe is just, uh, you know, um, like um, an object to these developments. So, who is actually access to uh, artificial intelligence is, of course, also a matter of resources and um, socioeconomic distribution of wealth. And connected to this is um, a range of things that we could um, summarize under the headline of transhumanist revolu revolution. So, it um, entails the enhancements of the human, so to say, but uh, can also be a big asset for um, progress in health. And at the same time, it raises a lot of ethical questions uh, when it comes to the human machine interface, but not only ethical questions, also a lot of um, economic questions and um, a, a questions that concern, um, of course, the skills in, in order to um, seize momentum of these technologies. Uh, so when, when we talk about society and nature, there might also be a, lo a lot of disruptions. Um, I mentioned climate change, but there, there are also um, a lot of other things that we might have to reconsider um, 
um, I, don't, I don't want to go into the details of, of converging technologies and, and manipulation on the biotechnological or nano level, but what I want to point out is um, and more and more people are thinking about redefining re the relationship between civil society or human on the one side and nature on the other side and the question how can we also give nature um, a stake in this debate and also in foresight activities but also in, in political dis um, planning and decision making um, just on the same level as we can give uh, generations that are not there yet, so future generations, a voice in um, making decisions on these because they will impact their future development. Uh, what I want to turn to now is um, how all these things used to be dealt with and, and maybe can be dealt with from the perspective of research and innovation policy in the future. So until recently we have seen a lot of enabling uh, policies in research and innovation that for example engaged in opening up uh, new potential for research and innovation and also um, developing more capacities, for example, on the EU level with um, initiatives like uh, the Research Council is doing and also a lot of activities um, in the uh, framework program. <coughs> but there has been little directionality and transformative ambition what was needed more is the testing of environments for potential crisis. Then another st uh, strategy we've seen recently, um, especially with the uh, credo on developing a more um, green, uh, a greener Europe and um, a digital Europe. Um, and how can we really transform our society into this direction? Um, this has been uh, a, a dominant topic for R&I policy recently. Um, so it w well, there was an attempt to clearly guide transformative pathways and targets, but it has not been maybe so, um, it has not really, um, how could I say this? Uh, been so efficient maybe. So more demand side policies could actually a way to en enhance this um, process and also um, looking for more consensus orientation because there's the potential for a lot of disruption among these policies. And this is maybe why we, we need something that's called here a catalytic uh, R&I policy approach. So it has not, it's not so common yet, but it's uh, like an idea to um, combine enabling and uh, transformational R&I policy into a direction that there is a foundation for transformative change to happen. So a policy that enhances uh, linkages and networks, especially networks with stakeholders, uh, networks with civil society, and also a more community building on certain issues, and a policy that enhances um, what we've already heard from the previous speakers to cut across silos, especially in policy making, but also across sectors, because these are still pretty much separated and do their own policies uh, often in a parallel way and often doubling um, their, their efforts, which is unnecessary. So we have to open up for directional corridors with regular adaptation mechanism and be maybe more mission orientated as has already started at EU level. So, and I, I think, or we think that um, Foresight can be very supportive in these issues, especially those that are maybe not so conventional yet, like testing um, environments for potential crisis or comprehensive and, and coherent policy packages and coordination, but also uh, maybe mission orientation. And 
uh, as I said in the beginning, this is not an effort that is limited to EU policies, but it's really a multi-level governance approach that is um, demanding the, the coordination at EU and member state level, but also at regional level. Um, an approach is needed that entails a flexible combination of enabling catalytic and transformative policy instruments to address the, the disruption that I pointed out and their dynamics and challenges. And I, I would like to conclude um, that um, we ha are currently a partner of um, a European project that's called the Eye of Europe where also a couple of people that are here in the audience and on the panel are members. And it's a European project that um, is supposed to coordinate and enhance foresight for R&I policy making. Uh, so the project has uh, started a few months ago and we are also offering uh, trainings for, uh, for foresight, especially for people who are in the R&D domain. And uh, one is on site and there are going to be a couple of uh, sessions online. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing that we offer. These are called the mutual learning experiences uh, or exercises where people come together that have already been in engaged in, um, in foresight activities, especially on R&I policy. So it's actually for member states, but of course, um, I mean, people from the OECD or UN can, can also join. There are some um, meetings on site, but there are also some online, and I think that the, um, the number of those that are online, the number of seats are not limited, so it's always possible for you to join in. And of course, on the, the platform, on the website, it's always possible to um, not only retrieve information on what's going on, but also to post your own activities um, especially at a regional level, and I think we have reached out to Peter de Smet's uh, an initiative also, I hope so. And we want to connect also to these uh, regional activities. Yeah, and, and by this, I, I'm ending. Thank you very much for your attention.